a little delayed. Anyway, really glad to be here this morning, and I just want to say welcome. I know Pastor Krista just said it uh, so well, but there are so many amazing churches here in San Angelo, Texas, that you could have gotten up to and driven yourself and your family uh, to go and be at this morning, to be worshiping and gleaning, learning um, about how good our God is. And uh, we just want to let you know it is a real thrill. It is a serious privilege uh, that you are here this morning. And I just believe you're going to be blessed just for showing up, regardless of anything I say or do. I believe that you just showing up, the Lord is going to bless you immensely. And so real quick, I know Pastor Brandon is not in the room, but can we show some honor to the senior leadership of this house? Come on, Pastors Brandon and Krista. Come on, we would not be who we are today if it wasn't for, you know, their integrity. They're leaning into the, to the things of God. And so I just want you to know that they are the real deal. Sadly, that is not the case for all pastors across the board. Pastors are people. Uh, but these people are the real deal. I've known them my whole life. And um, they are the same people behind closed doors as they are on this stage. And I just want you guys to know you are drinking from a pure well when you come to Celebration Church. And so really excited this morning. Just so love you guys. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, we've been in a series uh, that we are simply calling Simple matters. We've been in a series Sunday morning, and uh, really what we're doing is we are looking at how the simple things of our lives, they matter. They matter endlessly. And ultimately, Pastor Brandon has done such a beautiful and eloquent job over the last couple of weeks of showing us how things can be simple but not simplistic. And uh, some of the simple things of our lives are things that we really need to take another glance at and a look at. And today, I want to just jump right into the Bible. If you don't know me, again, my name is Keenan. Um, my wife, Beth, and I lead our young adult ministry, Shameless Plug. It meets every Thursday night at 730. I uh, would love to have you here. It's kind of turning into a mid bit of a midweek service, so it's really emphasis on 17 and up as a, you know, a young adult flair, but we would love to have you if you're ever not doing anything on a Thursday night. Uh, I preach pretty much every single Thursday. We have full worship. It's a great time in the presence of God, and so if you, if you find yourself with nothing to do at 7.30 on a Thursday night, would love to see you. But with that being said, you guys ready for the Bible? Let's go. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, a book of the Bible you may have never darkened the doorstep of, but today... We're going for it. Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 15. Solomon, who is the wisest man who ever lived outside of Jesus, writes these words. And he says this, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love. For the grapevines are blossoming. Solomon in his God-given wisdom is saying, hey, catch all the foxes, those little foxes. It's not just the great big things in our life that make a big difference. It's the small things in our lives that end up doing things that we never thought they would. And today, I really want to talk about how the simple day in, day out choices of your life matter. That the simple choices matter. Have you ever bought something and later regretted it? You ever bought something and you're like, an engagement ring? Okay, that was like, well, we were opening up a whole new can of worms. We need some healing up in here. Um, but have you ever bought something and instantly re regretted it? Um, I have many times in my life. And I remember this one particular moment. I was 19 years old and I was going to Bible school. I had moved to Dallas, Texas to go to Bible school. So yes, I do have credentials. Um, I am not up here just solely because of nepotism or anything like that. I did go to Bible school, okay? So uh, when I was in Bible school, I was 19. And one of my favorite pastimes with me and my friends was we would love to go to North Park Mall in Dallas, Texas. Now, I'll be honest with you. I grew up not much of a mall guy, but then when I moved to Dallas, I realized it's because I grew up with not much of a mall, all right? Sunset Mall is not my mall, all right? You can have it. It's all yours, okay? Uh, but Sunset Mall is not my mall, but North Park Mall was my mall. And me and my friends, me and my homies and cronies, we would go there every day after school. We'd go looking for deals because we were balling on a budget, much like I still am today, okay? <laughs> balling on a budget. So we'd go perusing the aisles, perusing the deals, perusing the clearance rack. And I remember one day I was perusing the clearance rack at one of my favorite stores and I found this super sick shirt, right? It was, a, it was an awesome shirt and it was a black t-shirt 
And on it were these black little decals on it. Um, It was black on black, and it was kind of hard to tell what everything was, but I just thought it was sick. I was like, this is awesome. And it was $10, all right, $10. I was like, if it's borderline free, it is borderline for me, and I'm going with it's for me, okay? So I take it off the clearance rack. I walk over to the counter, slap the shirt down, give the lady my $10, and I can't wait to wear this shirt at school the next day. So the next day I wake up, throw the new shirt on, and I go to the first session that we have of the day at Bible school, and it was called chapel. It was basically an hour-long worship service with about 2,000 young people just going full bore after God. I mean, we were getting after it. So I remember I'm in the worship service, and I'm just loving Jesus, right? I'm worshiping full tilt for an hour in my new shirt. All of a sudden, I remember after that, I had to go to some of my classes. So I'm in some theology classes. I'm taking rigorous theological notes. I'm writing down the heavy revies, that's heavy revelations that these guys are giving me. And I'm just feeling Jesus in my new shirt, right? That same day, my parents had decided to come visit me in Dallas. So all of a sudden, I remember, you know, after class is over, I meet up with my parents. I walk confidently up to my pastor dad. I dab him up. I say, what's up, son? He said, excuse me? I said, sorry, dad. The the anointing has gone to my head. Okay. He said, okay. Anyway, and all of a sudden, we we began to talk, and he's he's looking at me funny, looking at me up and down. And I was like, dude, what what are you looking at? He said, is that a new shirt? I said, yes, it is, Dad. (laughs) Yes, it is. And Dad, you'll be so proud of me. It was $10. That man is frugal, okay? That's code for cheap, all right? (laughs) He's cheap. I was like, Dad, it was $10. He said, "Uh uh-huh. Have you you looked at it? I said, what do you mean? Is that a trick question? What do you mean if I looked at it? Yeah, I had to look at it in order to buy it, okay? It's like, what are you talking about? He said, no, son, have you, like, really looked at it? I said, what, what, okay, what's the deal here? What are you getting at? He said, son, there are marijuana leaves all over that shirt. I said, what? He said, there are literal marijuana leaves, hemp leaves, cannabis leaves, okay, all over your shirt. I remember I looked down, and sure enough, there's like 200, the little black decals. I couldn't tell what they were. They're marijuana leaves littering this shirt. I was like, Dad, I've never seen a marijuana leaf before. I thought it was a palm tree, you know? The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. It's biblical. But no, I, he's like, son, it's, those are marijuana leaves, which I was kidding, by the way. I knew what a marijuana leaf looked like. But I was, I was mortified, and the truth is this. I had gone to my chapel service in my marijuana shirt, just worshiping the Lord. I had gone to my theology classes, taking my theological notes in my marijuana shirt. I had walked confidently up to my pastor dad, dabbed him up in my marijuana shirt. See, the truth is this. The marijuana leaves were there the whole time. They were there when I purchased the shirt. The problem was this. They were so small, I didn't realize what I was buying into. They were so small, I didn't realize the full ramifications of what I was buying into, of what I was saying yes to. And can I tell you this morning, that is exactly what Solomon is saying here in Song of Songs chapter 2. He's saying, catch all the foxes, those little foxes. He's saying it's not just the big wolves that you got to watch out for. It's those little foxes. It's the things that on the surface seem insignificant, but they bear extreme significance. He's saying catch all the foxes because listen to me, I have found this. It's the, the devil loves to use the smallest things to wreck our lives in the biggest way. The devil loves to use the small things to seep his way and creep his way in and destroy our life right out from under us, which is why today I felt urged to to, to provoke somebody to take inventory of their soul, to take inventory of their life and say, hey, look for the little foxes. Look for those little choices that you're making because the devil loves to use the smallest things to wreck our lives in the biggest way. And the reason he does this, can I just let the cat out of the bag real quick? The reason that the devil does this, the reason he starts small is because he knows something. He knows you're smart. 
Can I just take a second in this sermon and just affirm your intelligence this morning? I don't know when the last time you had your intelligence affirmed. I don't know when that last time that was, but let me just affirm your intelligence. You are highly intelligent. You are incredibly bright. You are brilliant. And the problem is the enemy knows it. The enemy knows that you're smart. What I'm trying to say is the enemy knows you're too smart for him to tell you his whole plan of how he wants to kill, steal, and destroy from you. The devil's never going to come and go, here's the whole plan, the 70-year plan I have in order to take you out. Want to let me do it? The devil's never going to come to you and go, hey, um, I have this, I have this chain Here's what I want to do. I want to wrap this around your neck and I want to drag you through the mud for the next 70 years. Here's exactly what I want to do. I want to parade you around embarrassingly in front of your family and friends and community, in front of the hordes of hell and my demonic forces. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you a lifelong addiction that sends you into a divorce and leaves your children despising they ever came from you. Here's what I want to do. Want to let me do it? The enemy is never going to come right out and say, here's a chain, let me do it. No, the enemy goes, I know you're too smart for that. So here's what the enemy does. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's no chain. I don't know what preacher told you I do chains. I don't do chains, my man. I don't do chains. Here's what I got. I've got a choice. All of a sudden, he brings you this little decision, this little choice. And you look at it, he throws it at you, you catch it, you look it over. What is this thing? You begin to flick it, maybe you buy it. Like, why do we bite stuff? <laughs> you look it over. It doesn't seem that nefarious. It doesn't seem to have any real consequence. I've never seen anybody literally be pigeon held to the ground by something this small. This is not a chain. It's a choice. But the problem is this. One choice always leads to another. And all of a sudden, a few weeks go by and the enemy sees you having a bad day. And he goes, oh, hey, slugger, you're having a bad day? You remember that thing I gave you last time? There's more where that came from. There's more. It got you through that day. Don't you think it'll take the edge off today? And all of a sudden you make a seemingly insignificant choice. See, the thing is this. This is where I think the world has a leg up on the church. They don't have a devil to blame for everything that they do. They've got to own their decisions. And what I'm trying to say is the devil can't make your decisions for you. Some of you love to get out of the stuff you get yourself in because you go, uh, the devil made me do it, okay? Uh, that's cute, and it might help you get out of trouble, but you didn't get that out of the Bible. The devil can't make you do anything. He can provide the gun, he can give you the ammo, and he can tell you where to aim, but he cannot pull that trigger. Only you can pull the trigger. Only you can make the, the decision. I, the devil has a part to play. I'm just here to tell you he does not have your part to play. He doesn't have your part. But all of a sudden, the devil just comes and he offers you a little seemingly insignificant choice. But the problem is, yeah, at one point, it was just two isolated events. But then all of a sudden, because you didn't get caught, nobody really found out. My wife doesn't even realize it happened. All of a sudden, it graduates from being two independent, isolated events to an entire weekend. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. It graduates to something even more serious. And all of a sudden you think, I guess I'll just, I'll just keep going down this road. You see, here's the sick and twisted thing about the enemy, man. Here's the twisted thing about him. The enemy doesn't bring us chains. He brings us links. And he forces us to build our own chains. He forces you to build the chain yourself through the choices he presents. You think they're isolated events, and then later you find out it was a chain of events. Think it's all nothing. Because listen, it just started as some small, seemingly insignificant choice. But the problem is that choices don't just stay by themselves. As I showed you, all of a sudden one choice beget another choice, which beget another choice. And I think we call that a habit. 
It graduates from being a choice and then becomes a habit. This is something I am doing regularly. It's not something I occasionally do and I occasionally slip up. I did that a long time ago. No, it's now habitual. It's happening frequently. And when it becomes a habit, it becomes automatic. Automatic. It's now not the, the, the exception to the rule. It's the rule. It's, it used to be how I occasionally slipped into sin. Now it's how I am obviously and definitely going to slip into sin. It, there's no question about it. I used to fight it. I used to fight the good fight of faith. I used to reach out to a friend and ask them to pray for me when the urges and surges would come over me. But now you know what? I'm giving in. What's the use of fighting it? And the problem is this, is that once it becomes automatic, it quickly becomes your identity. It used to be the thing you couldn't believe you did it. Now it's the thing you believe you do it because it's who you think you are. I do that, but it's because it's who I am. It's because it's my identity. This is why in 2022, we have people who would rather you know their sexual orientation before you know their name. It's because it has become their identity. Who I am in the bedroom is who I am. That's what you need to know about me. That's the sum total of my life is my preference over here. It has become my identity. And the problem is this, is not long after it becomes your identity, it quickly but surely feels natural. It feels natural. It's no longer this thing that used to feel foreign. I used to feel convicted when I do it, but now it just, it feels right. It feels good. I don't have a sting of conviction. I don't, I don't even fight this anymore. Why? You know what? The Bible is an antiquated, dusty old book that I think we need to do away with. We, we, we have surpassed this. We have arisen to a new level of intelligence. We know more than the wisest man who ever lived. We ought to just do whatever we please because it's natural to humankind. And I am here to tell you this morning that if sin feels natural, you can bet your bottom dollar you are in chains. If sin feels natural, I'm not saying that you occasionally slip up. I'm not saying that you occasionally go there. I'm not saying you occasionally do those things. I'm saying it's who you are. You have no qualms with it. You are no longer fighting it. You have given up on what God thinks because you have bowed at the altar of what you think. I'm here to tell you this morning, you're in chains. You are in chains. And listen to me, my friend. I did not come here this morning to pick on people who are in chains. I came here to let somebody who might be in chains know that there is in fact a chain breaker and his name is Jesus. He can do something about your chains. You don't gotta live the rest of your life plagued by that thing. You don't gotta be another statistic. But listen to me, though God is a chain breaker, he will only break chains you bring him. God will not break chains you will not admit you are in. He's too much of a gentleman for that. He will not infringe upon the free will he gave you. He wants to be invited in. That's why the Bible says this, that Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone would open, I will come and sup with him. I will dine with him. Below, I stand at the door. Open. Listen to me. Open the daggum door. It's time that we let the Lord into those nefarious places, the places the light actually needs to touch. Not the places you've done your cosmetic surgery and have made it look as good as you possibly can, but the places you've given up on. The places you're like, yeah, it's, it's gone to hell in a handbasket. Listen to me. Last I checked, Jesus took the keys to hell, death, and the grave. You know how defeated the devil is? He doesn't even have the keys to his own house. That's how totally and supremely Jesus destroyed him. But listen to me. You can empower him through your decisions. The devil has no, no power in and of himself, but if you fork over the power God has given you, he will have a field day. What I'm trying to get you to see is this. Today's choices become tomorrow's chains. Today's choices will become tomorrow's chains. Let me see the decisions that you're making, the choices that you're making today. I can tell you what chains you will wear tomorrow. You have a choice and this is why Deuteronomy 30, 19 says this. Let's read it. Deuteronomy 30, 19, God says this. Today, I have given you the choice 
between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you will make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. God's saying, hey, I'm the chain breaker, but guess what? You're the choice maker. I may be the chain breaker, but you are the choice maker and you've got a choice. I've laid before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose. What are you gonna choose? It's that black and white. It is that simple. There is good and evil. There are absolute truths today in 2022. It's no longer your truth and my truth. It is his truth. That's the truth that will set you free. That's what the Bible says. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Some of you are like, well, I love God. Loving God's not enough. It doesn't say then you'll know the love and the love will set you free. It says then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. You can love God all day long and stay in chains. Be heaven ready but living hell on earth because of the decisions that you're making. God says, I didn't come to bring you death but there it's available. And then he gives us the cheat code. Choose life so that you and your descendants might live. I know this is controversial, but I personally am so thankful that San Angelo, Texas became a sanctuary city because we as a community decided we are going to choose life for not only our generation, but the generations yet unborn. They deserve a fighting chance. We got to choose God's the chain breaker, but only you are the choice maker. And your choices become your chains. And there is no one in all of scripture that we see this truth on more display through. He is the poster child of this. And his name is Samson. Samson's story is found in the book of Judges. Starts in Judges 13 and it ends in Judges 16. Now, most of the time, if you grew up in church, you've heard about Samson. Usually his name is not mentioned alone. It's usually Samson and Delilah. I've got some church folk in here this morning. I love it. Samson and Delilah. And most of us, we would say, yeah, the one bad decision Samson made was Delilah. That was his downfall. One bad decision, young people, can ruin your life, which is totally true. But listen to me, Samson's chain was not built through Delilah. It was built slowly but steadily 20 years before he even met Delilah. I'll prove it to you. If we back the story up, Delilah shows up in chapter 16. If we back the story up to chapter 14, it's 20 years before Delilah's on the scene. And Samson's a young buck. Samson's a young man. His parents still have much to do with it in his life. He has not fully matured yet. And all of a sudden, the Bible says this, that Samson wanders down to a village called Timnah. And Timnah is a Philistine territory. You don't have to be a Bible expert to answer this question. Philistines, good guys or bad guys? Bad guys, right? And Samson wanders down into Philistine territory and sees a young Philistine girl and thinks, man, she got it going on. I like what they got down here in Timnah. And all of a sudden, the Bible says this. He sees this girl who's from a completely different people group than him. She does not serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that Samson serves. And all of a sudden, Samson comes home, and we see this. Judges chapter 14, verse 2 through 3. It says this. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, listen to this, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all the people that you must go and take a wife? Listen to this language, from the uncircumcised Philistines. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real with you, level with you for a second. When I was reading this in Judges 14, I, this threw me for a loop. Why in the world do they bring up circumcision? He wants a girl, newsflash. Girls can't be circumcised. Just make it real plain for you, all right? Cannot happen. Not biologically possible, okay? So why in the world do they bring up circumcision? They're trying to get Samson to see, you've got a covenant with God. She doesn't. They're saying, hey, 
Circumcision is a sign of covenant. Her people do not have a covenant with God. You do. He is going after someone who is not going after God. And can I just give you a little unsolicited relationship advice? Stop giving your heart to people who have not given theirs to God. Stop giving your heart to people who have not trusted their heart with God. Why would they, why, what tells you they're trustworthy of yours? They don't even trust God with theirs. This is the light bulb. They're trying to get Samson to, to, to see and for it to go off in his mind. But notice what Samson says. Let's throw it back up. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. She looked good to me. They're telling him, Samson, she doesn't have a covenant with God. Samson says, I don't care. I don't care. Samson, this girl doesn't have a covenant. Samson, what they're trying to say is, God doesn't approve of this. This is off limits to you, sir. And Samson goes, I don't care. You know you are building your chain when you quit caring about what God has to say about what you're doing. You know you are steadily but surely getting in more bondage, getting deeper in your chains when you quit caring what the Bible has to say about what you are doing. He says, I don't care. And notice this, he completely disregards the, the sound advice of wise counsel. His parents are like, hey man, I, I, this is your life, but I want to let you know this is not right. And Samson says, I don't care. It looks good to me. Listen to me, my friend. A key sign of somebody who is deep in bondage, deep in their chains, is they quit caring what wise counsel has to say about their life. You start running to people who tell you what you want to hear versus what you need to hear. You need people who will lovingly confront you about your crap. Can I say it that bluntly? I don't think lightning will strike. You need people who will lovingly confront you about you and say, hey, I love you enough to talk about this. They're not going to go and air your dirty laundry. They're not going to have talk to a committee before they come talk to you. We have to follow the Matthew 18 principle of if you have a grievance with your brother, go to them in private. Then if they don't listen, then bring in other people. Then if they don't listen to that, then bring them before the council. Then if they don't listen to that, then wash your hands of the situation. But we've got to go down the pecking order the Bible gives us. And you need people who will lovingly confront you about you, saying, I love you too much to let you keep banging your head against this door. I love you too much to let you destroy yourself. God has too big a plan and a purpose on your life to let, to, for me to sit by while you ruin everything he put on the inside of you. You need people who will confront you about you. And Samson says, I don't want to hear it. And can I just fast forward the story, this little part, for time's sake? It ends catastrophically. This young woman from Timnah that he marries, go read Judges 15 and find out what happens to her. She gets burned alive along with her dad by her own people because of this marriage. She dies because of Samson's decision, which is why you need to know your choices affect more than you. Your choices affect more than just your life. You think, oh, I'm not hurting anybody by doing this. It's just my life. What, what is it to you? Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And it's like, hey, hey, hey there, there are ripples to this thing, my man. There are levels to this. Samson's choice didn't just affect him. It was her end. It's literally how she passed away. All of a sudden, we fast forward 20 years later. This all happens 20 years before the most famous mistake Samson makes. And the reason I show you this 20-year gap is to prove to you, you don't grow out of your chains. Samson surely thought, oh, in a few years, this will no longer be a problem for me. I'll grow out of it. My hormones will level out and I'll see clearly. But for right now, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sow my wild oats. Can I just help you? If you're, if you're sowing wild oats, what do you think you're gonna reap? Oh, I'm just going to sow my wild oats. Have a wild harvest, my man. It's going to be horrible. But over the years, Samson's chains didn't corrode and they didn't rust. They solidified. And that is the lie the enemy will tell you. Oh, you're going to grow out of this. This is just you right now. Listen to me. You don't grow out of it. You get healed out of it. You get set free out of it. You get saved out of it. You get prayed out of it. 
You cannot shake yourself free. Samson wouldn't listen. And Samson, listen to me. There's a little fact I uh, left out of until this point. Samson is the strongest man in the scriptures, literally physically strongest man in the scriptures. There was a supernatural strength that was given to him by God because of a deal Samson's mother made with an angel that came to her. He, the angel said this, the spirit of God is gonna be greatly upon your son, but he can never cut his hair. He, has, he had to take what was called a Nazarite vow. Could never cut his hair. And as long as he didn't shave his head, as long as he didn't cut his hair, the spirit of God would come greatly upon him. And the Bible says this, that Samson could rip apart a lion as one does a young goat. Now, I don't know about you. I have never ripped apart a young goat. Um, I hear that's the stuff serial killers are made of. So I stay away from that, okay? I do not hurt animals, all right? But evidently the Bible thinks pulling a young goat apart is easy because Samson could do it to a lion as one does a young goat. I mean, Samson at one point killed hordes and droves of Philistines using nothing but a, a, a donkey's jawbone. I mean, he took city gates and sent them hurling into the distance. The spirit of God would come over Samson and Samson would do crazy feats of strength. And so all of a sudden, over 20 years of this strength being on him, he became the bane of the Philistines' existence. They hated Samson, terrorized them. And so all of a sudden, 20 years later, they want to take him out. And all of a sudden, we darken the doorstep of Judges 16. Judges 16 starts off in a very low place as well. Samson is leaving the house, listen to me, of a prostitute. He's just had a one-night stand paid for illicit sex with a prostitute. Just to show, he used to actually go through the whole charade of marriage to get what he wanted. And now he's like, yeah, I'm not even going through the charade. Just let, let me pay you. This is how rough it gets, my friend. Perversion knows no end. So all of a sudden he leaves the house of a prostitute. He ends up in what the Bible calls the Valley of Sorek. And he meets Delilah. Delilah is the original valley girl. The Valley of Sorek. Your mom warned you about valley girls, didn't she? Just mine? Okay. <laughs> Joking. But Delilah, all of a sudden, is she's a Philistine as well. Samson didn't learn from Timnah. And all of a sudden, Samson catches eyes for Delilah. She is, she, she is a sight to be seen, and they begin to be a couple, and the Philistines catch wind that Samson's with Delilah. So they pull Delilah aside and have a little powwow. They say, hey, Delilah, we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver each, if you will find the source of Samson's strength and tell us what it is. 1,100 pieces of silver each. That's a lot of silver. And Delilah says, that's my number. <laughs> I have a number and you found it. I'll find the, sor the source of his strength. So that night, Samson comes over to her pad as usual. They're hanging out doing God only knows what. And all of a sudden, Delilah asks him the question. In fact, let's read it. Judges 16, 6 says this. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound to where one could subdue you. Just slips that in there. How you could be bound to where somebody could subdue you. I'm not going to lie to you. I call that a red flag. <laughs> That's a red flag. If after the church service today, you come up to me and go, Pastor Keenan, that was a great word. I'll say, thank you, brother. And you go, real quick question. In fact, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. I'm asking for a friend. Um, how might you be bound to where one could subdue you? I'm going to go, Mike Hernandez, lieutenant on the police department, please deal with perpetrator over here. Why do you want to know how to tie me up is what I'm going to ask. That's a red flag. She's asking, how could you be bound to where you could be helpless and never get back up? We call that suspicious. This generation calls it sus. <laughs> That's sus. What is this? Because listen to me, Samson blows right past the red flag, blows right past it. Because listen to me, when you've been blowing past God's red lights and God's warning signs, you'll blow past red flags all day long. Well, I haven't cared about what God says. Why would I care about what this logically looks weird? I'm just going to keep going. So all of a sudden, Samson blows past it, and he tells her, but he tells her a lie. He says, well, what you got to do is you got to tie me in seven bowstrings that have never been dried. And so Delilah, that night when Samson goes to sleep, she ties him in seven bowstrings that have never been dried, and she gets this whole charade. She backs up, and she goes, Samson, awake, the Philistines are upon you. 
I don't know why I gave her a British accent, but I've never met anybody from Sorek, so I'm just doing the best I can, okay? The Philistines are upon you. And Samson jumps out of bed, rips through the seven cords, and says, where are they? And he's ready to fight. And Delilah goes, Samson, you lied to me. You lied to me. You don't love me. Notice what she's doing. I believe in 2022, just another term we use, this is called gaslighting. <laughs> He's the victim, but she's making him feel like the perpetrator. You lied to me. You're what's wrong. When she's the one trying to bring about his demise, what's she doing? She's manipulating him. And I'm here to tell you today, the devil only opens his mouth to manipulate you. He only talks to manipulate. It's not occasionally he'll manipulate, but most of the time he's out for just good conversation. He's always out to manipulate you. She begins to manipulate him. You don't love me. You lied to me. So Samson blows past this. All of a sudden, the next night comes. She asks him again, and Samson says, I know it was seven bowstrings last night, but actually the secret is it's new ropes. You got to tie me in new ropes. So that night, she lulls him to sleep, and he gets wrapped up in new ropes. She does the whole charade again. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Wake up. And all of a sudden, Samson jumps up and rips through the new ropes. Rips right through. Where are they? She goes, Samson, you lied to me. Does the whole deal again. This happens again the next night, except Samson says, this time you got to put my hair in a new loom. Notice, up until this point, he's not mentioned his hair. And in this moment, he mentions his hair, but he doesn't tell her he's got to cut. She's got to cut it. But notice what he's doing. He's flirting with the edge. He's flirting with the thing that'll actually get him in trouble. Because listen to me, the devil loves to convince you, if you can balance over here, you'll for sure be able to balance up here, big boy. If you can handle this, you'll for sure be able to handle that and never fall in. And then all of a sudden you take him up on it and a good old gust of West Texas wind takes you to your demise. He is flirting with the edge. This is why the stuff you watch has to get raunchier and nastier and scarier as the years go on. It's because that old stuff that used to do the trick, you now consider kid stuff. That's kid stuff. doesn't do it anymore. This is why the stuff you watch on the internet has to get nastier and more perverted. It's because what did the trick at 13 doesn't do the trick at 33. You now need a new level of perversion. You need something you've never seen before. You need, you need, and, 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 the, and the end is never going to come. Perversion knows no end. It takes you further and further and further. Samson's flirting with the edge. And all of a sudden, she ties him in the new loom. She puts his hair in it, and Samson rips out the new loom, and she does the whole thing again. And this time, the Bible says this, that night after night, she badgered him. She pressed him so hard that the Bible says Samson's soul was vexed to death. That's literally the language the Bible uses. Samson's soul was vexed to death because she pressed and pressed and pressed and asked and asked and asked and nagged and nagged and nagged. And listen to me, my friend, the devil is never going to shut up as long as you tolerate him standing in the room. Eventually, you have to quit ignoring him, doing your Christian la, 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 and begin to speak with some authority and evict that fool altogether. It's time to get out of here. This temple belongs to the Lord. It was bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You are trespassing. Eventually, you got to quit ignoring him and begin to speak truth over him and say, you have no place here. Because he will keep talking and keep talking and keep talking the longer you tolerate him. Delilah wouldn't give up. So all of a sudden, Samson's worn out. His soul is vexed to death. Samson gives in. Can I tell you right now, I don't care how astute you are, I don't care how much scripture you know, if you tolerate the devil, the strongest among us will give in. If you try to fight the devil in your own strength, the strongest among us will give in. This is not the, you know, the devil goes after the weak link. He's going after us all. And we've got to fight using the weapons that God gives us. And the Bible says this of our weapons, that they are mighty in our God for the demolishing of strongholds, for the pulling down of high places and making them low places. That's what our Bible says. But are you using what God has given you? He finally gives in and says, all right, Delilah, here's the secret. I made a Nazarite vow 
which basically means I can't cut my hair. And as long as I don't cut my hair, my God will give me supernatural strength. But if I cut my hair, something bad is going to happen. And the Bible says this, that she could tell Samson told her the truth. She's like, whoa, that came from a real place right now. And notice this, he got vulnerable and she lulled him to sleep in her lap. Just think about that scene, a woman sitting there brushing her man's hair, just trying to let him go to sleep. It looks so sweet, but the intent is nefarious. She's lulling him to sleep so that she can shave his head, so that she can exploit his vulnerability. Can I tell you? Yeah, the enemy might be being sweet to you now, but he caresses you so that he can lay your head not on a cushion, but on a guillotine and all of a sudden hit the rope and send you decapitated into your future. That's what the enemy's out to do. And I felt the spirit of God wanted to come up in here and say, wake up, Samson. Some of you, you are literally on the lap of Delilah now. Somewhere in your life, you've allowed this enemy to lull you to sleep. And the Lord sent me in time to say, it's not too late. Wake up. But for Samson, it was too late. She lays his shaven head on the pillow. And this time, the Philistines actually lie in wait. And she says, Samson, awake. The Philistines are upon you. In fact, let's read it. Judges 16, 20. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep. And notice what he says. I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. I'll get myself out of this. I've done it before. I can do it again. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I can make my life right. I can get this under control. Don't worry, I'll get it under control. And what he didn't realize was that the Lord had departed, that the spirit of God, which was what was actually giving him strength, wasn't there. And I'm here to tell you, some of you, you think you can handle it in and of yourself, and you can't. You're just like Samson. I'll shake myself free. Stop it. No, you won't. You're no match for what the enemy's doing for the powers of hell. You in and of yourself, all by yourself, are no match. You will give in every time, and you, like Samson, will awaken, not knowing that the Spirit is waiting for you to lean into him, but you're fighting the enemy in your own strength. I'll shake myself free. And Samson couldn't do it. The Philistines overpower him because his strength was gone. They wrap him in ropes, and they lead him out of the room. And the Bible says this, as if it wasn't bad enough that his head got shaved and he lost his power, They gouged out his eyes. They plucked out his eyes. I'm telling you, the enemy always takes more than he tells you he will. He always tells you, oh, this is as bad as it's going to get, and he takes more. He's a punk like that. Sin always takes you further than you want to go, costs you more than you want to pay, and it keeps you longer than you want to stay. It always overpromises and underdelivers every single time. The enemy is a liar. And here Samson sits, strengthless and visionless. No strength, no vision, no way to navigate his way out of this anymore. And some of you, that's where you're at right now. No strength to speak of. Not an ounce of vision. Can't see how you're ever going to make your way out of this one. Can't see how your marriage could ever be put back together. Can't see how your kids will ever respect you ever again. Can't see how you'll ever taste another moment of freedom. Can't see how you would ever go to sleep without that nagging, accusing voice being there. Strengthless and visionless, that's the way Samson sat in the dungeon. He sits there. This man who used to be a freak of nature is now down in some cave, and he's grinding He's grinding grain at the mill, chained. The Bible says this, the most redemptive verse in the whole thing. I love it. It says this, verse 22, but the hair of his head began to grow again. After it had been shaved. I came here to tell somebody this morning, I don't care what you've allowed the enemy to do to you. 
I don't care where you've gone, what you did, and who you did it with. I don't care how high your body count is. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how in the red you are. I don't care how big the mountain is. It is not too great for our God. You may have allowed the enemy to shave you, but Jesus came to save you. He can save you. The hair on his head began to grow again. And the Bible says this, Samson's story ends like this, that the Philistines bring him out in front of everyone, all the Philistines. There's about 3,000 of them in number, and they put him between these two pillars. He is literally their court gesture at their party. They want to hold this great and mighty Samson up in order to spit at him and laugh at him. 3,000 Philistines, and he stands there, strengthless and visionless, the most humiliating moment of his life on display as a joke. And Samson standing there in the lowest moment of his life does something simple. Simple matters. He prays a prayer and he says, God, if you would but give me strength this one last time, I'll do what's right. And the Bible says that after he prayed that prayer, he asked this little attendant boy to put his hands on the pillars that were next to him. He said, here we go. And he just began to push those pillars. And the Bible says this, that as Samson began to push, the Lord began to pour. That the Lord began to pour his strength back into Samson. And the harder Samson pushed, the more the Lord poured strength back into his body. And Samson pushed and pushed. And all of a sudden, one pillar began to crack. A crack runs up one. And all of a sudden, the other begins to crack. A crack runs down that one. The foundations of the palace begin to shake. And all of a sudden, Samson gives it one last push. And the whole place comes colliding in on top of him. And he and 3,000 and Philistines die together. That is how Samson's story ends. The Bible literally says this, Judges 16, verse 30. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those he had killed during his life. Notice what happened. Samson defeated his enemy by sacrificing his own life. Who is that a picture of? That's Jesus. Notice this. One moment ago, Samson was the poster child of compromise, of bad decisions. And then he prays one prayer in his lowest moment. And then he's transformed into a picture of the Messiah, a picture of life, a picture of the gospel. He's a picture of Jesus on the other side of one simple prayer. That in his lowest moment, when he had no strength, no vision to speak of, he said, God, I can't do anything about this, but you can. And I'm going to let you into this moment. And I felt the Lord wanted to meet you and yours. Maybe your choices have built your chain, but listen to me. One choice to put your faith in Jesus can break your chain. I felt God wanted to meet you here this morning. That God will take you from being a poster child of compromise to a picture of the life-transforming power of the gospel, a picture of Jesus himself. And if that's you right now, can we just bow our heads and close our eyes real quick, just for a moment of privacy and concentration? If you would say, Keenan, I'm, thank you for giving me some extra time this morning. I'm sorry I've gone a little long, but if you would say, Keenan, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never said yes to his work on the cross, his finished work that covers all my sin, past, present, and future. If that's you this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. But I feel there's another group of people here this morning. He would say, Kenan, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. But I've been living in some compromise. I've been making choices that I can see have become my chains. And I'm ready to give the chains to God. I'm the choice maker and I'm ready to give God the chain so he can be the chain breaker. And if you fall within one of those two places, if you'd like to say yes to Jesus for the first time or you'd like to say yes to the yoke destroying power of the gospel to meet you in your compromise, there's no need to tell everybody what you're doing, but let God into it. If that's you, I want you to shoot your hand up right now as a sign of surrender and faith. If you fall within one of those two places, Hands going up all over this auditorium. Listen to me, don't let pride keep you bound. Don't let the chain of pride, that's what some of you are chained to. You're chained to pride. 
You've got to look militant. You've got to look strong. And what you're going to find is eventually you will hit rock bottom. And the good news is that Jesus is still the rock at rock bottom. If that's you, raise your hand this morning. Leave it up. I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every hand in this room because that hand represents a life. It represents a chain that they are offering to you. God, I thank you. Now, break the chains in Jesus' name. We're not asking for emotionalism, God. We're asking for the supernatural power of God to come in and do for them what they cannot do for themselves. I'm not asking for more inspiration, God. I'm not asking for more militants. I'm asking for your power. Your power. Lord, I thank you that you break the chains and you give them, woo, you give them the strength to walk free in your grace the rest of their life. Lord, I thank you for those who just put their faith in Jesus for the first time. I thank you that they are heaven ready right where they sit in Jesus' name. They never have to worry about that ever again. And I thank you that you're moving in a greater way than they can see. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, come on. Amen, amen. Can we put our hands together for what Jesus did this morning? Come on. Would you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray a blessing over you as we go. We have our prayer partners coming forward. I understand today's message was a, a little heavy. And if there's something going on in your life and you need, you need somebody to actually stand in the gap with you, we have people who are highly trusted and they are ready to love on you, never, never heap shame on you, never say, how dare you? They're ready to love on you and pray for you. Some of you just get shame prayed off of you. I feel that right now. Somebody just needs to come up here and just get shame, guilt, condemnation prayed off of you this morning. I'm gonna pray a blessing as we go. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice, those listening in this room and those listening online. Lord, I thank you that you go before them. Make your face to shine upon them, God. Let them see that you're not embarrassed by them. You're not annoyed by them. You're not ashamed to be associated with them so they have no need to be ashamed to be associated with you. And I thank you right now. Cause everything they put their hand to to prosper. Open doors no man can shut. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen, amen. Y'all be blessed, church. Thanks for coming to church today. Drive safe.